Turn to Romans 14, if you would. We've been talking about in chapter 14 not passing judgment or on one another or despising one another because of disputed matters and, and we're continuing that discussion today. It was evidently a big deal in the church in Rome and Paul is teaching the believers there, even though they differ in some things, how to fight for the unity of the church, how to keep the main thing the main thing, how to agree to disagree on some things. And let live together, be arm in arm for the gospel, one in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read from verses 10 to 19 this morning. And then we're, um, we're going to focus in a little tighter than that and look at verses 17 to 19. And I'll tell you why in a minute. <clears throat> it might seem like I'm skipping some stuff, but I'm not. Uh, verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. But rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. But what you, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. I'll, I'll stop there. Let's pray. Lord, indeed show us how to pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Lord, I thank you for the unity that we enjoy in Grace Church, and, but we can always grow tighter, more unified, more intimate as brothers and sisters in Christ in one body, one local representation of your church. So help us this morning. Help me to preach your word in the power of the Spirit, trusting you to take your word and do your work. Help us to hear your word as your word delighting in it and seeking to live in its light. May the sun be lifted high. May souls be converted. May souls be sanctified. Do your work in us. Perform your heart surgery with the scalpel of your word. We give you all the praise for it. And ask for it and trust for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The time has come. The kingdom of God has arrived. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus coming forth and saying what John the Baptist had said. That the kingdom has come. Repent and believe the good news, the good news that the kingdom has come, that long awaited kingdom that would have been shocking to the ears of those who heard. They would have had a lot of false expectations about Jesus maybe being king and what that might mean and deliverance from their enemies. They would have not have seen the suffering servant coming before the conquering king. But the kingdom of God has come and the fact is that changes everything. It is here. Now it is, it is here. Jesus said if he cast out demons by the finger of God that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he did. So it has. 
This kingdom, this true kingdom brings with it true righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And believers are kingdom citizens. It's a kingdom that has been inaugurated by the first coming of Christ and will be consummated with the second coming of Christ. It is growing now through the proclamation of the gospel. But when we think of kingdom, or when we think of the words God's kingdom, we we think at least in two ways. One, you know, a kingdom is a realm over which a king reigns, right? And so when we hear God's kingdom, one way we think about that is the overarching sovereign rule of God over all that He has made. He created all things. He sustains all things. He's governing all things toward His glory in the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a sovereign rule. Think of that as the large umbrella under which is a smaller umbrella. God's sovereign rule is the big one. His saving rule over His people. His kingdom, His messianic kingdom. Primarily what Paul is talking about and what Christ was talking about when He announced that was the messianic kingdom had come. His rule. And that's our subject today. And really the question is, how should I live in light of the fact that He is the King? In fact, that His kingdom has come. How should that shape my life? So today we're going to talk about what, we, what I called kingdom living. That's what Paul is challenging the Roman church with in verses 17 to 19. So why would I skip verses 13 to 16? That's a good question. First of all, let me promise you I'm not skipping it. What I'm seeking to do is lay the foundation for it. And so you might find this interesting. I have a slide for this. I know you may not be able to see this uh, unless you're close to the TV, but I'll explain it to you. So this is kind of a look at the structure of verses 13 through 23. And if you're familiar with this kind of language, it looks like a chiastic structure. That's not important that you remember that. But it kind of looks like an arrow, doesn't it? And so what you have in verse 13 is the mention of stumbling blocks. And then in verse 14, faith that all foods are clean. Verse 16, therefore do not grieve and cause one another to stumble. You have what we're going to look at today here is the tip of the spear. And then backing back down, you see that verses 20 and 21, do not grieve and cause one another to stumble matches here. Faith that all foods are clean matches here and not putting stumbling blocks before one another matches here. So the point of all of that is that this is the foundation for these commands. This truth right here, the nature of the kingdom, sets the foundation that we will then build on with those commands. Because this is true, do this. So as I wrestled and struggled with how to preach this text this week, I came to the conclusion that it's best to lay the foundation first before you build the house. That'll help you if you're going to build a house. You might want to start with the foundation. Jesus talked a little bit about that. So today we're going to focus in on 17 to 19, and then next time we'll come back and look at the the commands that surround it. But today, uh, 14, 17 to 19, kingdom living. Main point here. Rejoice that the kingdom is here and rededicate yourself to following Christ by living a life of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Rejoice that the kingdom is here and rededicate yourself to following Christ by living a life of righteousness and peace and joy joy in the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at the kingdom defined first. And then we'll look at the kingdom lived. And then we'll look at the kingdom benefits briefly, very briefly at the end. And uh, those will be referred back to in the coming sermons as well. But first, the kingdom defined. Look Look in verse 17a. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. I'll stop right there. But notice the tense there. The kingdom of God is not. Follow it. it doesn't, notice what it doesn't say. The kingdom of God will not be a matter of. As though it was in the future. No. Is right here. Present tense. The kingdom of God is. And then we can flow from that. 
It is here. It's a present reality, but it's one that needs definition. So first, Paul is good as a good teacher. He starts with what the kingdom is not before he tells us what the kingdom is that he's talking about. First, we, we, we go the way of negation before we define. Paul says what it is not, then he says what it is, and then he applies this message to the current struggle in uh, what's going on in, in the church in Rome. That's why he had stated kind of the commands he was looking at and then this truth and then sort of reiterated them because what we're going to look at today is that foundation. But first, look what he says. He says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a matter of external ceremonial concerns and debates over food and drink. And we've talked about that some, and we will talk about that more as we go forward. But just let me remind you, and you can go back and listen to those sermons. And again, again, these topics are not going away. We'll bring them up and focus in on them. But he's saying, this is not what the kingdom is about. These, these, these concerns that you have about whether or not to eat meat and whether it's been sacrificed to idols and whether or not to drink wine and we could fill in a whole other list underneath that. Uh, those are, those, these are, this is not the focus. This is not the main thing. This is not keeping the main thing the main thing. We are talking about here on the matters of food and drink, what we've already called disputable matters. Second-tier matters, opinions that differ between weak and the strong. And Paul's point here is, look, one of the reasons you're having these discrepancies within yourself and these divisions and these debates is that your focus is too low. You're, you're, you're aimed too low. These are all matters. If it's a matter over which we can agree to disagree, it's one which we can be patient with one another and stop judging one another over because we are in the kingdom of God and this is not the kingdom's major focus. One of the things the Christian life is compared to is a race, isn't it? And the goal is Christ-likeness. So if you're ever running a race... Let's say you're running a 100-yard dash. What would happen if as you are running this race, you are looking at one another and sniping about somebody's shoes or shorts or their technique or their form, and you're all looking around doing this and critiquing one another? What's that race going to look like? You're going to be running into one another and tripping and falling. and No, no, no. In a race, where are you focus? You focus on the tape. You focus on the goal. And you run like mad toward that goal. You stay in your lane. Christ is judge. We've already talked about that. There is a judge. I always say there is a God and it's not you. There is a judge and it's not you. It's Him. So in this race of the Christian life... If we will focus in the right place, which is on Christ and Christ's likeness, then we're running the race the way it's supposed to be run. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first, of first importance. This is where your aim is at. Look to God. Look to me. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Everything you need will be added to you. To run this race as you are striving for and stretching for into the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So our focus and our aim has to be on our highest priority and then everything filtering down underneath that highest priority. And here in this text, our highest priority is the kingdom of God. Living as good citizens of the kingdom of God. I remember the first time I read... Uh, Goldsworthy's book on the kingdom. He gives this definition of the kingdom, and I never forgot it. Some things you memorize instantly, don't you? They just stick. But Goldsworthy's definition of the kingdom is this. The kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. 
When we're talking about what Paul's talking about in chapter 14 here, what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about seeking the kingdom and his righteousness, it's God's people on God's place under God's rule. And you see the foreshadowing of that in the Old Testament and the reality coming with the coming of Christ. So what we're in God's kingdom as God's people. We're in God's place and we're under God's rule. And we're to be pressing into that and trusting Him to be the judge. There's an already, we've already talked about this, there's an already and a not yet to the kingdom. It's been inaugurated. It is growing and it is yet to be consummated. It will have to be consummated when Christ returns. But who are God's people? This will help you, okay, as you watch the news. God's people are those in Christ. Jew and Gentile, one new man in the Messiah Jesus. That's God's people. God's people are those in Christ. Where is God's place? It's God's church. It's Christ's church. That's God's place. And what is God's rule? Christ's commands, which are no different than God's commands. Right? Fulfilled in, amplified in Him. And he tells us that love for him will produce in us a joyful obedience to him. Look at this list of things that we have. And listen, I'm not exhausting the topic of the kingdom this morning. but I'm trying to make this make sense here in Romans. But look at these riches that we have in the present form of the kingdom. In the present form of God's kingdom, we have these things that you, you probably want to write down. If you're... I told you before, the elect take notes. And, I, and you look at me and you say, yeah, yeah, I'm taking them up here. All right, if you can walk out that door and remember them, I'll let you get away with that. But other than that, I'm going to challenge you with pen and pencil. Why do you think we got a big box of pens back there? But you have these, look at the riches that you have as being in God's kingdom in its present form. First and foremost, Jesus finished work. Redemption. Redemption accomplished and to you applied since you are in his church. But what is his finished work? What did Christ come to do? What was pictured in the Old Testament through all the, the, the prophecies and, and sacrifices and everything that you read there, those were types pointing forward to the true Messiah who was coming, that he would be the Lamb of God, John said. All those lambs back there, they couldn't really deal with sin. They just covered and pointed to this lamb who would come, who would really deal with sin. This pure and spotless lamb of God. The one who has lived under his own law and fulfilled all righteousness for his people. See, we had to have a righteousness if we're going to be reconciled to God. We can't just have a blank slate. Because the word tells us it's the righteous that will dwell with him. We had to have a righteousness. And that's what Christ provides for his people as he lives under his own law and fulfills it in thought, word, and deed. See, we had broken it in thought, word, and deed. That's why we're called sinners. Sinners, sin is the breaking of the law. We had broken it in thought, word, and deed. And we were sinners under condemnation who needed a savior. Christ came and fulfilled the law and provided that perfect record before God that we need but it's not he's not done yet as the lamb of God we know that lambs died the lamb had to die he had to offer his life as an atonement he had to go to that cross and he had to die for his people his blood poured out his body broken he died for us why he took the cup of wrath that we deserve a soul that sins shall die, spiritually and physically. What we deserve is hell and condemnation forever. And he took that upon himself on that cross. And see, because he was God and man, he could do that. If he was just a man, he couldn't do that. He couldn't sustain the wrath of God for his people. He couldn't say from that cross, it is finished before he left the cross. But being the God-man... He could take that burden upon himself and drink that cup dry. The suffering he suffered physically was nothing compared to the suffering spiritually. Imagine.
taking, no wonder he sweat drops of blood in the garden, taking the holy, righteous wrath of God due the sin of all of his people onto himself and drinking that cup dry, taking the eternal hell that we all deserve, the condemnation we deserve, taking that upon himself and drinking that cup dry. He finished that work. He fulfilled all righteousness. He died to pay the penalty for our sins. He went in the grave and, and well, we just left him there. Well, they did just leave him there. And in fact, the Romans sealed the tomb and the Jews had guards posted around the tomb. Couldn't stop him from blowing the doors off the tomb. He didn't, knock, he didn't blow the door. It, listen, go read it. it the, the stone was blown away from the tomb. It did not just politely roll back. Any talk of the disciples stealing the body is silly. Those trembling, scared knuckleheads were in the room afraid they were next to die and didn't believe the report when it came to them. But Christ rose the third day proving it's all true. And he rose victoriously. And nobody's ever disproved it. And in fact, there's great proof for it. Christ is risen. We, we say that when we celebrate the Lord's resurrection. We say it more than that around here. But that's his work. See, he lived for us. He died for us and he was raised for us. He's reigning for us. We're talking about his kingdom and he's coming again someday. The scripture says Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried, that he was raised the third day and that this is the gospel by which you are saved. Notice, isn't it good that God doesn't say, you be good and I'll save you. We, a lot of us believe that. We think if our good works outweigh our bad works, he'll let us into heaven. We might just be a little bit dirty. He'll let a little bit dirty people into heaven. Mm -mm. You are either fully forgiven or not forgiven. And all of our righteousness is filthy rags. We can't be good enough. That's why Christ came to live for us, to die for us, and to be raised for us. And the good news is, He even works the faith in us to trust Him through the preaching of the gospel. So that we come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we weakly put our faith in the right place, which is in Him, and God's working that in and through us. When we trust in Christ, we are united to Him. We are cleansed and forgiven for all of our sins and we are accepted as righteous because His righteousness is credited to us. Think about that. If you're trusting in Christ this morning, your record before the judgment bar of God reads obedient in thought, word, and deed perfectly. All your unrighteous, filthy robes were taken away just like Joshua's in the high priest in Zechariah 3 and his clean, pure, righteous vestments are put upon you. You are a child of God who is forgiven for all of their sin and clothed in the righteousness of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we have Jesus' finished work, redemption, the gospel. Are you trusting in Christ this morning? Number two, we have Jesus enthroned and reigning. All authority has been given to me in heaven and upon the earth. He's not waiting to reign. He's on the throne. He's reigning now. Number three, you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Christ indwells your own heart by His Spirit. If you're trusting in Him, if you know Him, He's closer than a brother. He's in you by His Spirit. Justification by faith alone, I've already talked about that, but that is a rich treasure that we have. You know, pardoned for all of our sin and accepted as righteous in His sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Stop trying to save yourself. You're not qualified. Trust in Jesus. And listen, fifthly, we have Christ promised victory. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates are defensive. Gates don't come at you offensively. Gates are trying to keep you out. So Jesus' finished work, we have. Jesus is enthroned and reigning for us, we have. Fullness of the Holy Spirit. Justification by faith alone. Christ promised victory. He will complete His work. So just to continue 
or sum up our definitions and, and move on. So God's kingdom is the sphere in which God's will is primary. Isn't that what Jesus taught us to pray? Your name be hallowed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's the sphere in which his will is primary. It's an internal kingdom in redeemed hearts. That doesn't mean there are no external manifestations. It's the redemptive reign of Christ. It's entered by the new birth. Jesus said you can't even recognize the kingdom of God if you're not born again. You can't see it. What he means by that, you, can, you, you don't see him as king and submit to him, receive his salvation and love him and seek to live for him. Being born again comes first before you ever ha- repent and trust him. It doesn't come after that. You don't have... Uh, it's entered by the new birth. It's advanced by gospel preachings. And all, all of its citizens, all of the citizens of the kingdom of God are growing in obedience to Jesus. If you're not growing in joyful obedience to Jesus, you might not know him. I mean, surely you could be in a sort of what we call a backslidden time, but don't justify that and try to stay there for crying out loud. If you do that, you don't, I'll just say you don't know him. You're loving sin more than him, and that needs to be repented of. But all of, his, all of his citizens are growing in obedience. It's God's people in God's place under God's rule. So how do we live there? The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, drinking. So how do we live in the kingdom? What are the priorities of the kingdom? Point two, kingdom lived. The rest of 17. Look at the transition there. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, drinking, but you could say, but it is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So let's take those one at a time. First, righteousness. The reference here in this verse is not to the imputed righteousness of justification. Okay? The reference here in this verse is to the righteousness, the growing righteousness of sanctification. It's it's to that practical righteousness, that ethical righteousness, that growing Christ-likeness. Righteousness in our sanctification, righteous, what we're pressing toward that goal is Christ-likeness. That's what we're growing in, is Christ-likeness. If if you're familiar with the catechism, question 35, shorter catechism, the question I didn't put on your sheet, what is sanctification? Everybody can remember that. Now look at this definition, and I've encouraged you to memorize this one as well. Sanctification. Notice justification was an act of His free grace. Sanctification is is the work of His free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God, and enabled, look, look what God is doing in us. And enabled more and more to die to sin and live unto. Oh, that's weak. Y'all not used to talking in a sermon, are you? We die, we are dying, growing in our dying to sin and living unto. Thank you, you woke me up. That's really me waking you up. That's a trick, but. <clears throat> Look at that. We are, we are renewed. We have a new heart. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit enabling us to progressively more and more die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, pressing into what He calls us into, growth and grace. The more days I live on this earth as a citizen of his kingdom, the more I should be being conformed into the image of Christ, which means I hate sin and am turning from it progressively, and I love him and love righteousness and am pressing into it and growing in it, and it is defined by his commandments. There's no vagueness about what righteousness is. Having no other gods before him, right? And on down the list we go. The law of God is the law of Christ. There's no difference. You can see that in 1 John. Lots of places I could go. The first 
matter of living in the kingdom is a pressing into, not oppressing, but pressing into this righteousness that he calls us to press into. Dying more and more to sin and living more into righteousness. But 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Listen, you want to know if you have a distorted theology? If you think that's legalism. That's one of the ways. <laughs> Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Peter says make every effort. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Pursue righteousness. Not the righteousness of justification. We have that. We have Christ's righteousness credited to us. That's why we are justified. Our record before God. This is our growth in Christ. Pursuing His righteousness. Pursuing righteousness like Him. Seeking to be more and more like Christ takes a pursuit, takes a making every effort, takes a pressing into. God calls us to joyfully obey Him and grow in it because He has sacrificed His Son for us. In other words, to love Him because He has first loved us. It's not legalism, it's love. The old song said, who do you love? Your life will show you who you love. So how do I pursue righteousness? I'm going to give you, I don't know why I turned into a Southern Baptist preacher this week. But I'm going to give you three, three P's. I'm going to give you three R's in the application. and give you three P's here. I don't know what happened to me. How do I pursue righteousness? Number one, pray for it. Pray for your sanctification. Pray that God would sanctify you. Pray that He would grow you in grace. Pray that daily you would be more and more like Jesus. Did you hear that word, daily? Pray daily for growth. Pray into His will. You know it's His will. This, you can pray this confidently. <coughs> Lord, sanctify me in Christ today. At the end of this day, may I be more like Jesus as I was at the beginning of this day. And you won't always feel that or be able to quantify that, okay? And some days it'll feel like it's really way worse than it is. But are, listen to me. Look at me. Are you praying for your growth in grace? Your own growth in grace? Hopefully now you are. Praying for your family members' growth in grace, your brothers' and sisters' growth in grace, your children's growth in grace as they know Jesus or their salvation. But listen, we forsake the means of grace so easily, don't we? We just get discouraged because we're not like Jesus and kind of want to throw our hands up and give up. Pray into it. God will answer that prayer. He says if we pray anything according to His will, we know we have what we ask. So first, pursue righteousness by praying into it. Then by partaking. Partaking of what? The Word of God. And if you're struggling with particular things, partake of sections that deal with those particular things. All foundation of it is the gospel, though. Right? Remembering who you are in Christ. But listen, Jesus prayed. It doesn't work any other way. Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. He didn't say sanctify them by their feelings or by their bank account or by their grandchildren or by their, you fill in the blank. So the implication is if Jesus is saying sanctification comes in his word and I'm ignoring his word, I don't care about my sanctification. That's a heart problem. I'm willing to receive his love, but I'm not willing to extend love back to him. In the Word, being shaped by the Word, look at me. Sometimes you feel it and sometimes you don't. Sometimes something jumps off the page and sometimes it doesn't. But this is the Word of God and the Spirit uses this Word to grow you in grace. And if you have a, a time when you read through a section of Scripture and you feel nothing, okay. That's just God weaning you from you. Right? But the, spirit, the word never returns to him void. The spirit always uses it. Do you remember every math class you ever took? Yeah, only the really bad ones, right? 
But, but every one of them were productive. You know how I know? You can add. You can subtract. You can divide. And I won't press you farther than that because that might be as far as it goes. <laughs> <coughs> but pray for sanctification. Partake of his word and then press into the growth. Press into it. So pray, partake, pre- partake, press. Press into what you see in the word. Don't just read it and, go and check it out. See, we, we're a little legalists, so we'll just read something and check it off and move on about our day. But meditate on it. Think about it. Interpret it rightly with Christ in the center in light of his coming. But apply it. That's what I'm saying, really. Pray, partake of the word, and press into growth by applying the word. One of the things Paul prayed for the Philippians, he prayed that they would be, look at Philippians 1.11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. If you are in Christ, you will be being sanctified. Notice it didn't say that might come through Jesus Christ. Righteousness, this righteousness, this practical righteousness, this sanctification that we're talking about is a fruit. It's a fruit of God's Spirit working in you. So pursue growth in grace. Focus on, you see, if we're focused on Christ and focused pressing into being like Christ, then we got our eyes in the right place. place we'll run our race in our own lane and we'll stop kicking and beating and tripping up our brothers and sisters over things that don't matter in the big picture. So the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, drinking, but of righteousness and look, we're not exhausting these topics, I know, and of peace. And when we think about peace, we usually think about the subjective peace, don't we? The experiential peace, what we feel, the tranquility in our heart. And that is a factor, okay? But that, that, don't, that, that comes from a, an objective peace with God. And we've seen this in chapter 5. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The war is over. We're not his enemy anymore. Jesus has reconciled us to God, so we have peace with God. So that's objective peace. And then flowing from that is this subjective peace from God. As Listen, this peace grows as we deepen in our understanding of the gospel. If you just grow in your understanding of the law, it's not. We need law and gospel. We need to know who we are in Jesus. But the better we get the gospel, the more an abiding peace we'll have that will transcend the circumstances that we experience. You can weep in sorrow and have peace. You can leap for joy and have peace. I mean, all the experiences. This peace is the gift of God through the means that God has provided. In our justification, we have an objective peace with God so that we might walk in a growing peace as we better and better get the gospel. And this kind of peace, listen, this peace of heart, this tranquility that comes from the gospel of heart is meant to bleed out on those around us and help them walk in this kind of peace. This this is a peace from God that leads to a growing peace with one another. See, if I'm really focused on the gospel and know who I am in Christ and pressed into being more and more like Jesus, I'm going to be way more peaceful in understanding and caring with those around me because I see how far I fall short and how far I have to go. Right? This is peace. This becomes a horizontal peace that we extend to one another as we understand things. The word doesn't say, blessed are the judges, does it? Blessed are the peacemakers. So the kingdom of God is about this righteousness and peace and then look, and joy. This is a contagious excitement for Christ and his kingdom. Are you a joy spreader? Are you a joy spreader? Is God working his joy in you? And then is that, would people around you say, in general speaking, she's a joyful lady. I don't really know how, considering what she's going through, but she's still joy. He's a joyful person. 
He makes me more joyful just to be around him. That's not true of judges, is it? Do you have a contagious, contagious excitement for Jesus and his kingdom? This is a, an enjoyment of God because of his grace. This is a deep-seated satisfaction and contentment in Christ as your Savior. And it is contagious and promotes joy in others. Are you confident that you're in Christ? Are you pursuing a righteous life? And therefore, are you confident that you have an objective peace? And therefore, as you understand the gospel, you're growing in that peace and affecting others into that peace. And do you have this contagious excitement for Christ and his kingdom? An enjoyment of God that is contagious to others. If you do, it's because of the Holy Spirit of God. Look at the, look at the verse. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy that you produce. Joy in the Holy Spirit. These things are what the Spirit produces in those that are God's children that are taking His gospel seriously and seeking to walk with Christ. Look at this description in Acts 13, 52 of the disciples. It says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Spirit brings joy. How about the fruit of the Spirit? What does Christ's likeness look like? It looks like the list of the fruit of the Spirit. What is this righteousness and peace? This peace, all this stuff. Look at Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. These things are what God's Spirit produces in the hearts that He indwells and in the lives that He indwells. Christ's likeness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. There it is. Peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Judges don't tend to be gentle. Self-control against such there is no law. Why? Because these things are keeping of the law. Are you a loving person? A joyful person, a peaceful person, a patient person, a kind, a good, faithful, gentle, self-controlled person and growing in it. Listen, we're not perfect in all those things yet, but don't, again, don't use that to justify sin. Be thankful for His grace and press into growth. Press into growing in your weak spots, not justifying them. This is what the Spirit does in the heart of the child of God. Produce this thirst, hunger, and thirst for righteousness that we press into it and, and this peace that flows from understanding the gospel and this joy, this contagious excitement for Christ and His kingdom. See, this righteousness, peace, and joy does not come from judging one another over disputed matters, but by focusing on Christ and on the priorities of His kingdom. So what are the kingdom benefits? And I'm, I'm going to go through this quick. You see it in verses 18 and 19. But there are some promises here to following this way of life. So look at, look at verse 18 quickly. Whoever thus serves Christ... By pursuing these things, by living these priorities, these are the most important. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Because this is the way God's calling us to live. And as we take Him seriously and love Him in return and live this way, obviously that's acceptable in His sight, even though we're not perfect in it, because of His grace to us in Christ. Right? But approved by your brothers, by those around you. Not approved by everybody. The world's not going to love you because you're being like Jesus. Stop trying to impress the world anyway. Who cares what they think? Other than us not having a bad reputation because of sin. The church gets in so much trouble trying to impress the world. That's what the whole seeker-sensitive foolishness was about. That's another sermon and I don't have time. <laughs> approved in the church. True brethren, this will promote peace they will see you as a loving joyful peaceful gentle helpful person and then look at verse 19 whoever thus uh, no, so then here's a conclusion for you so then let us pursue and when you think about pursuing does that sound easy flippant if it just happens to be 
No, it's focused pursuit. If you, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Living a kingdom life will produce peace in the church as we do that together and mutual upbuilding or edification. Yeah, there are times when we need to, con- to confront lovingly one another if we've offended one another and, you know, and all of those things, but not over disputed matters. Right? And we're going to talk more about that as we keep moving on. But John Calvin said it, it, that it is the job of the of believers to make Christ's kingdom visible. It's an invisible kingdom that is made visible in his church. And Christ said we will be known as his disciples by our criticism of one another. Is that what he said? By our love for one another. If you want to know what love is, go read 1 Corinthians 13. That, the first part of that will help you a lot. When we get the main thing right, this is what we will see. Love for Christ, love for one another. Not bickering over secondary matters. And I, I, I'm thankful that I, for the most part, am in a context where this kind of kingdom living is taking place, but we can all, again, we can press in. We, we're not glorified yet. We have to press in and grow. Some of us need to hear this more than others. So let's stop there. How do we apply this right quick? Here's my read, three rees. You'll see what that is. First one is rejoice. Isn't, isn't that kind of the flavor? Rejoice. The kingdom of God is here, and you are in it. If you're trusting in Jesus, he's your king. He's coming. He's coming again. He's going to finish the work He started in you. His hell cannot prevail against His church. He will finish His work. There will be a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language around His throne. One day the the knowledge of the Lord and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and the new heavens and the new earth. You're on the winning team. Throw off that pickle juice you got on you and start celebrating. Some of y'all want to tell me you're not people that celebrate, and then I watch you watch a football game or something. Mm-hmm. The kingdom is here, and it's growing, and you're a part of it, and you're an instrument in His hand to take His gospel and His grace to the ends of the earth. So let's do some more rejoicing. Because Christ said it was good news, didn't He? The kingdom... The time has come. The kingdom has arrived. Repent and believe the good news. So rejoice. Secondly, repent. This is the rededication part of the main point, if you're wondering. Repent of ceremonial priorities. Repent on focusing too low. Repent on beating each other up over disputed matters. Repent of having a focus less than what Christ said is the focus of kingdom living. Repent of losing sight of the fact that your God reigns looking above the sun and that He's your Savior. Certainly if you don't know Christ, turn and trust Him. Repent of following, going your own way and seeking your pleasure in this world and its sin. Turn and receive, trust in, rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as a believer, repent of all these lower disturbances. Get our eyes on the high. And that's the third one. So rejoice, repent, and re-aim. I found this acronym. It's used in the medical world, and I changed it, okay, to fit in here. So if you've heard this before. But re-aim on kingdom priorities. So here's what it is, acronym for those letters. Reach, that's effective, reach effectiveness by adopting, implementing, and maintaining kingdom priorities. Reach effectiveness, if you're not taking notes, I know you're not going to remember this. Unless you have a really, really fabulous memory. My memory is good, it's just short. That's why I have to write things down. Reach effectiveness by adopting, 
implementing and maintaining kingdom priorities, which are righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Believer, the kingdom of God has come and you are in it. And that changes everything. So repent and believe the good news and focus on kingdom living in Christ in this way. To live is Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the amazing grace. Thank you that Christ came to save sinners. Thank you that what you demand, you grant through the preaching of the gospel. You call the world to repentance and faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen and reigning and returning. So I pray, number one, that those under the sound of my voice are those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him alone for salvation. And for, the, for those of us who know you, Lord, may, may this be a day of, of rededication to kingdom living, to really loving you because you have loved us first. And seeking by your means, not our own inventions, but by your means, by your grace, to be daily putting off sin and putting on true righteousness, true Christ-likeness. To have this abiding peace and this contagious joy that will encourage and strengthen those around us. I guess bottom line, Lord, help us to take the gospel seriously that we have been purchased by Christ so that we will no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised for us, who is reigning for us and who is returning for us. So convert those who do not know you, I pray, and grow in grace those of us who do so that we can leave here knowing more about and actually putting shoe leather on what it means to be living in your kingdom. Producing us those who are characterized by true kingdom living. That is your work of grace. We, can, we cannot do it. You must do it. So we pray that you would do it. And since you promised to do it, we trust you to do it. Convert and sanctify your people. Build your kingdom. Send us forth as the light and salt that you call us. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray.